that's important. So let's talk about what is employment discrimination? Well, the way EEOC investigates is we look for a difference in treatment, a difference in treatment because of an individual's race, religion, their skin color, their national origin, their age being 40 and over, if they have a disability, and genetic information. When I say sex, that's not only sex-based discrimination, it, is, it encompasses pregnancy and if you are a lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. So sexual orientation and gender identity are also covered. Sexual harassment as well. Oh, time for another poll question, Mary Jo. Take it away. Oh, right. she's ready. She's ready and waiting this time. Yeah. How many charges of employment discrimination do you think were filed throughout the U.S., and this includes the U.S. Virgin Islands, in fiscal year 2019? And that's the last statistics that we have to provide. So take a good guess. Take a guess. Okay, well, interesting. Nobody thought between 25,000 and 50,000. The ant and it, it, it's interesting that there's like a three-way split between these two. The answer is actually 79,000. 79,000 cases of employment discrimination. Now, does that mean findings of discrimination? No, that doesn't mean that. It means that 79,000 individuals came to us because they felt that they were being discriminated in the workplace. They felt that they were being discriminated. And retaliation was our number one charge filing. More people felt that when they complained about discrimination in the workplace, they were retaliated against. But we'll go forward and discuss that more. Ah, retaliation, yes. Retaliation is prohibited under all of the laws that we enforce because we say that a person should feel that they have the right to complain. Everyone has the right to complain without feeling that they are going to be somehow disciplined or somehow degraded or harassed or even fired because they've, filed, because they've had the opportunity to voice a complaint. That includes filing a charge of discrimination if they are participating in an investigation and they give testimony that is favorable to the complainant. All of these people are protected. Let me give you a good example of retaliation and how someone was covered. We had an individual who resisted, resisted their boss's direct, um, their direct authority when the boss told them to fire someone that was black. They said, no, no, that person is doing a really good job. I don't, I don't want to fire this person. I'm not going to fire this person. And so the boss said, okay, I'm firing you both. Both of those individuals had protected protections under the laws that we enforce regarding retaliation. Let's talk about some of the categories that we investigate under or that people can file a charge under. And we have first race. And these are the different categories that are assigned Asian American, African-American or Black, Caucasian or white, Native American or Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander. Now, these categories are not actually written into the law. These are categories that we, bought, we um, borrowed from the Office of Management and Budget in order to 
have subscribed categories. And, and how would somebody be discriminated against? Well, unfavorable treatment based on the fact that that person is of a particular race or if they have characteristics associated with that race because say their hair texture or their skin color or certain physical features. It includes things like racial epithets, offensive or threatening symbols, and racial stereotypes. You know, we all know that no stereotype is ever good. National origin, well, that deals with where your family is from, where you come from, whatever ethnic group that you belong to. So everyone deserves the same opportunities and can't be denied equal employment because of your birthplace, your ancestry, or any of those other factors. Time for a poll question. Can an employer tell staff they can only speak English at work? What do you think? Yes or no? What do you think? Then I'll tell yep. you what the law says. Three more seconds. All's ending. Can't wait to see your answers. Ah, interesting. It's a 50-50 split. An employer can tell you to speak English only at work when it is regarding work-related matters. However, However, during break times, during free times such as lunch, an employer cannot tell you that you have to speak English. So for example, if there's a group of people and at work and they're all sitting in the break room having lunch and someone's having a phone conversation with someone else on their cell phone in their native language and people have expressed that they're offended by that. That's really too bad because everybody has the right to speak their native language during their free time. Now I go as far as to say is if you allow people to discuss their kids' baseball games or the movie that they saw at the water cooler or other people are speaking English about non-related business matters then, or non-related matters that aren't related to business, then you should allow your, uh, your other workers to speak whatever their native language is as well. So the answer to that question technically is no. You can't require them to speak English only during their free time at your work. Color basically re, uh, refers to someone's skin pigmentation, right? And their skin shade or their tone. We all know that between different races, sometimes people are lighter or darker complected. And we have seen discrimination based on people's complexions. In fact, we had a big lawsuit in um, Miami Beach, uh, a, a hotel in Miami Beach, that was discriminating against their Haitian workers. And it was because of skin tone. The people that had a darker skin tone were getting less favorable assignments than people that had a lighter skin tone. And there's more to that, but that's the simple explanation for you. Religion deals with moral or ethical beliefs. It doesn't have to be necessarily a traditional religion, such as Protestant or Seventh-day Adventist or Catholic or Buddhist. It can be your sincerely held moral and ethical beliefs as to what is right and wrong that's held with the strength of traditional religious values. All faiths are sincerely held. If you're an atheist, your right to not be a believer is um, certainly covered. Also characteristics associated with religion, clothes, hair, and music, for example. 
I actually remember specifically uh, investigating a case regarding someone that was Wiccan and their employer was a Christian faith and they were, they were appalled when they found out that this individual practiced Wiccan. They had the right to do that. They had the right to practice whatever religion they wanted and an employer should not have an animus against that. Let's talk about this scenario, okay? And, and uh, let's, let's see that if this is discrimination based on religion. Tell me what you think. So Joseph works in an office, uh, which opens to the public at 8 a.m. Joseph's boss, who's the company owner, holds a 30 minute prayer meeting every Wednesday before working hours. The boss says attendance at the prayer meeting is voluntary. Just, just come if you want to. So Joseph isn't particularly religious. He doesn't ever attend these meetings. When the boss starts laying off people because of COVID-19, Joseph is laid off along with other people who didn't attend the prayer meeting. What do you think? What do you think? Is this religious discrimination? Is this possible job discrimination based on religion? And we have three more seconds. Polls ending. Again, a 50-50 split. This is possible job discrimination based on religion. Given the scenario that we have here, Joseph did not attend a voluntary prayer meeting. This prayer meeting happened prior to business hours, didn't it? So you didn't have to show up if you didn't want to. In fact, the boss said, this is voluntary. However, however, when it came time to lay people off, who did the boss look at? He wasn't looking at anything based on what the facts we have right here. It looks like Joseph was laid off because he wasn't attending the prayer meeting. Now, this is just the basic information we have here. It is possible job discrimination based on religion. Once we ask the employer, maybe there's other factors, but on its face, this looks like it could be religious discrimination. The boss used the fact that those people didn't come to the prayer meeting as the reason to lay them off. All right, I think that there was, that poll question probably went, was gonna go there. So I'm just gonna move on to the next. Religious accommodation. The law requires that an employer try to reasonably accommodate a person's religious beliefs and practices. But the caveat to that is if it would cause more than minimal burden to the operation of the employer's business. So an employer might need to make a reasonable accommodation. They might need to make a reasonable adjustment to the work environment that will allow someone to practice their religion. Best example I can give you of that is Let's say that um, I like to attend church services every Sunday and my church services are nine to 10 o'clock in the morning. Now, normally I'm scheduled to work on Sundays from seven to seven. I might ask my boss for the accommodation to attend my service. That boss doesn't necessarily have to give that to me unless it is minimal burden on the operation of their business. For example, if there are 10 other people that do the same job that I do on Sunday at, and are at work during that same time, perhaps one of those persons could assume the duties just for the you know, hour to hour and a half that it's gonna take me to get to my service and come back. But this is a case by case basis. All right, case by case, there is no hard, fast rule. We always request that people try to accommodate, but under religious accommodation, 
that's not necessarily um, a hard and fast rule. Sex discrimination is based on someone's gender, all right? Also sexual harassment, pregnancy, and if someone is lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. And let's go over this. So what is sex-based harassment, for example? Just harassing someone because they are a male or a female. That's very different from sexual harassment. There's not that sexual component. So it could be offensive remarks about somebody's sex. Um, you know, saying something offensive about a woman in general. It's not sexual in nature. So here's a scenario. Ashley gets a new boss at work who begins making comments that she should stay home to look after her children instead of being a working mother. What do you think? Do you think that this is sex-based harassment? Five seconds. Absolutely, yes. Sex-based harassment because it is comments that are made about her due to her sex. When a case that I investigated a long time ago, an individual was actually, she'd been working in the company many, many years, um, very successful. All of her colleagues were males. She was doing very well until a new boss came on. That new boss suddenly started leaving her out of meetings, not inviting her, uh, not sending her leads, her sales leads, and doing things to exclude her. And the only reason was because she was a woman and he felt that she didn't belong in that workplace. Sexual harassment, we've heard a lot about the whole Me Too movement, haven't we? So it's sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, comments, physical touching, a tangible, a hostile work environment. Let's talk about that first. A hostile work environment is where the atmosphere is so pervasive, sexual jokes, um, sexual banter, uh, you know, different things that are sexual in nature that you can't help but be affected if it is offensive to you. And it is, and then it becomes a hostile work environment. A tangible employment action is something, for example, like a boss that the most the most common example is a boss that says, um, you know, if you sleep with me, you will be promoted, and the person doesn't do so, and they are demoted or fired. That's the best example of that. Pregnancy discrimination. Now, one. One thing that people don't know about that employers can't discriminate against someone because they're pregnant, they are pregnant, they were pregnant, they could become pregnant, or they're thinking about becoming pregnant if they have a medical condition related to a pregnancy, or if they had an abortion, or they're considering having an abortion. All of those things are covered under the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, which is um, an act that amends Title VII. Let's have that poll question. If an employer has concerns about a pregnant woman's safety on the job, can they let her go and tell her she can come back after the baby is born? Tell Five more seconds. Think. Tell us what you think. These answers are great. I really appreciate all your participation here. And the answer is no, no. It is absolutely no, and here's why. You know, it seems like this is the benevolent employer. They're concerned, oh my gosh, maybe this woman will slip and fall in the workplace. 
you know, I don't want anything happening to her and her baby. And an employer cannot make that decision. Only the woman and her doctor can make that decision. And we actually see your, your response is reflective of a lot of cases that we see where benevolent employers, well-meaning employers send the woman home. They send her home and say, you know, sorry, come back after the baby is born and we'll re-employ you. But an employer cannot do that. That is against the law. So sex stereotyping involves um, and, and gender stereotyping charges of discrimination that are filed by lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender individuals. Individuals that are LGBT are covered under the laws that we enforce. In fact, you may have heard of the recent Supreme Court decision, I think it was two weeks ago, where the Supreme Court gave coverage to individuals who are LGBT. So just because someone it, talks or dresses effeminately, that means that you cannot discriminate against them or because a man likes a pastime that you consider unmanly, there is no such thing. People can and do have rights under the laws based on being lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender. And let's ask this question now, please. Can an employer lawfully deny a transgender employee access to the bathroom that corresponds to his or her gender identity? What do you think? This has been a question of, of, that I've heard a lot of people ask. So I want your opinion on this. What do you think the law says? Five more seconds. Hold closing. Can an employer lawfully deny that is correct? 100% knows, and that is correct. And you know, I, I'm, I'm glad that you have that understanding, that clear understanding, because that is a matter of, has been a matter of great controversy. So thank you for that. Let's go forward now. Let's talk about age. Now the age, is great. everything else was covered under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. Does anybody have any questions? Shami, you've been monitoring the chat box. Has anybody indicated that they have a question so far? Nope, I haven't seen any questions in the chat box. Okay, well, maybe later. Please, we'll have an opportunity and you have opportunities all along to ask any questions that you want. All right, moving on to age. The Age Discrimination and Employment Act protects people who are 40 years of age or older from discrimination. You know, a lot of times we see, especially when there's downturns in the economy or um, a, a company is undergoing a restructuring, we may see that people that are in the an older age category are, are chosen for layoff or for dismissal, almost as if those employers think that their older workers don't need the money to eat any longer or pay their mortgage. We protect people who are age 40 and over. In fact, within this law, um, employers can favor someone that is 40 and over, and that is not discriminatory against younger employees. Oh boy, I'm full of questions for you today. I hope you like answering them. Can you ask for a person's birth date on an employment application. Can you do that? What do you think? It's a question I'm asked a lot also. I'm gonna guess you have just a few more seconds. All 
all right, you can ask for a person's birth date. There is absolutely no law that says you can't ask for someone's birth date. However, the question really is going to be, why do you need that information? Why do you need that information? If you're looking to hire somebody and you're looking at their qualifications, then their age really shouldn't make a difference to you, should it? It really shouldn't. So you can ask that question, but if someone files a complaint of discrimination, we would ask, why did you need to know? All right? So, you know, generally speaking, employers may leave that off of their, uh, you know, asking for a date of birth or asking the age on an employment application. It's probably good practice, but it's not unlawful to have it on there. Okay? Elaine, can I ask a question? This is Shami. Absolutely. So one of the questions we get a lot or we see is that they've asked for social security numbers on an application and kind of like a birth date, that's irrelevant until a post offer, correct? So there's really no need to ask for that in an application. Would that be correct? This is not something that I actually have an answer for, Shami. Okay. I don't know the answer to that question, but I can certainly understand why people would be concerned about giving their social security number, their full social security number, especially in, in today's world. Um, someone might choose to maybe la give the last four of their social or something that doesn't identify the entire number. That would be a best practice that I would um, suggest if they're faced with that question. But I think that you're right in saying that, you know, no one needs to have that information before the hire. There is not, this is not actually something that's covered under our law. So I'm just giving a best practice suggestion. Okay, thank you, Elaine, thank you. Okay, all right. Now, Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. Maybe some of you were scratching your heads when I said that the, the EEOC actually protects your rights with respect to your genetics. And what does that mean? You know, in today's world, genetic information is so easy to obtain, all right? So if you participate in a wellness program, for example, an employer cannot obtain your genetic information except in an aggregate form. This is what I, this is what I mean from that. Um, they must tell their medical provider who's collecting those blood samples and those questionnaires that ask, you know, what did your mother, brother, sister, you know, uncle have with respect to various diseases. They can't provide that information to your employer. They cannot do so. They can tell your employer, hmm, you know, this percentage of your employees may be susceptible to diabetes. This percentage of your employees may have a susceptibility to heart disease or cancer or any of the other types of conditions that could be genetic in makeup. So they, an employer cannot ask for that information. And if they receive that information, they can't use that to discriminate against you. How might they discriminate against you? Well, let's say that my employer finds out that I'm predisposed to diabetes, all right? And the employer says, boy, if she's predisposed to diabetes, I don't think I wanna bring her on because sometimes diabetics have issues with their blood sugar and she might take more time off or she might need time for medical appointments. And so they automatically just say, boom, I'm not gonna hire her because I don't wanna take on that risk. That's genetic information, all right, that if they had received, they could use against me in an unlawful way. What I like to tell people, and the next thing we're gonna talk about is the Americans with Disabilities Act but, and, and coverage there. But GINA, as we like to refer to the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, GINA prohibits discrimination based on genetic factors, all right? 
So it's not conditions that have manifested themselves in someone versus the Americans with Disabilities Act. That is a manifested condition. You currently have epilepsy. You currently have um, PTSD, right? Those are conditions that are apparent and that you're dealing with today versus something that you may or may not have in the future based on your genetics. All right, another scenario here. Fred's sister died. In the obituary column of the local newspaper, the family requested that in lieu of flowers, donations be made to a local cancer institute that specializes in the treatment and study of cancers. Let's have our poll question. Thank you, Mary Jo. Is this genetic information? Is it? Yes or no? Eight more seconds to answer this question. This is genetic information, all right? It is publicly acquired genetic information because one might presume that because the relative, they're asking that someone give a donation to a cancer center, there may be a presumption there there may be a presumption that cancer runs in that family, all right? This is not an absolute 100% guarantee that this is genetic information, but the presumption here is that the family would ask, that the family would ask for donations based on what that person died of, all right? Now, if the employer takes an adverse action against you because of that genetic information, then you would have rights under the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. It is publicly acquired information. Our hope is that no one would do that. It may be difficult to prove unless there was a witness to a comment or um, you know, some, something that the employer said about this. But technically, this could be construed as possible genetic information. So let's talk about the Americans with Disabilities Act now, unless we have questions. Shami, do we have any questions? There's no question in the chat box at this time. Wonderful. Going forward, the Americans with Disabilities Act prohibits employment discrimination against individuals with disabilities. And I always like to say that people with disabilities are people with incredible abilities. And the whole purpose of the Americans with Disabilities Act was to give people with disabilities a chance, a chance to become employed. I think statistics show that people that have disabilities are one of the highest groups that are discriminated against. In fact, I know statistically in Florida, after retaliation, disability is the next highest charge filing. So many people with disabilities feel that they're not being given equal opportunity in the workplace. Who's protected under the Americans with Disabilities Act? an individual who's qualified for the job. And what does qualified mean? It means that they have to have all the requisite skills and abilities to perform the, the functions of that job. Someone that has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity, that it substantially limits a major life activity, that they have a record of a disability or they're regarded as having a disability. So what does substantially limits mean? You know, possibly that they're not able to perform 
a major life activity, and we'll talk about that, a major life activity that an average person in the population might be able to perform, or they're otherwise significantly restricted because of their condition to perform a particularly major life activity with respect to the majority of the general population as a whole. What does it mean if someone has a record of a disability? Well, um, the best example of that is someone that had cancer and they're now in remission. They have a record of a disability or someone that has had back issues in the past. They've had uh, back issues and they have a record of a disability. What about someone that is regarded as disabled? How about that person? Well, for some reason, someone would believe that they have a disability. And if they can show this, every, of, every one of these individuals is protected under the ADA. What does it mean to be qualified? A qualified individual with a disability. That is a disabled person who with or without a reasonable accommodation can perform the essential functions of the job. Let me break that down for you. Um, what are essential functions of the job? Well, if I am a secretary at, or a front desk receptionist, let's use that example. I'm a front desk receptionist. What would be my essential functions probably? I would answer the phone. Maybe I would do some light computer work. Um, I would greet people as they came into the office. Those would be essential functions of my job. But let's say I had a permanent mobility issue. And one of the minor functions of my job is that I have to empty out my own trash can every day. This employer's cheap. They don't have um, a service that comes in after work and cleans up the office. So I have to go and I have to empty out my trash. But the trash receptacle where we have to go is way on the other side of the building. It really takes me a long time. It's really difficult for me to go that far. That's not an essential function, is it? And that might, with an, a reasonable accommodation, such as asking someone else to take my trash can when they go and empty it out, all right, that might be an accommodation that I don't have to perform that non-essential function of my job. Workplace accommodation is a, an enormous component of the Americans with Disabilities Act because sometimes there are duties that if a person had an adjustment or a change to their workplace, they would be able, that qualified individual would be able to perform the essential functions of their job, to participate in the application process, and to enjoy all the benefits and privileges of someone else in the workplace. So how does accommodation work? Let's have a poll question. If I ask for a reasonable accommodation due to my disability, can an employer ask me for supporting medical documentation? Yes or no? What do you think? Ten more seconds. The poll is ending. Can't wait to see what you say. The answer is yes. So asking for a reasonable accommodation, an employer should engage in what we call the interactive process. The interactive process, working with the employee or the applicant to find out what would be best meet their need to help them be able to perform the essential functions of the job. And we always encourage employers, just ask the person, ask the person, what is the best way that we can accommodate you? Because that individual might have some ideas. If the employer says, 
I need supporting medical documentation to show that you need this accommodation. That's not something to be offended by. It is something that should be limited. You only need to provide medical documentation that is specific to your need under that request. An employer isn't entitled to all of your medical information. If you ask for um, a screen, um, a computer screen or some sort of adaptation to your computer screen so that you can read the fonts more easily or um, that enlarges the fonts for you, just what is necessary. But an employer needs to engage in an interactive process now let's say that I come up with that screen reader and the one I find on Amazon is $3,000. Woohoo, this is the one with all the bells and whistles, isn't it? The employer does some research and they find one that's $100 or $50 and they get that one and they put that on your computer screen and guess what? It is effective. The accommodation has to be affected, effective. So even though you might request something different, as long as the accommodation that is received is effective, that's what matters. The other thing I like to remind people is that even though, hey, this accommodation is now in place and everybody's a happy camper, remember that accommodation needs could change they could actually change after a while. So it's important to check back with the employee, to have a conversation with the employer. Um, there may be training that is needed to use whatever the, um, the item is. Uh, there may be maintenance required. So just because you've put an accommodation request, uh, uh, you found the right accommodation at that moment, doesn't mean it won't change. And so follow-up should be ongoing. Follow-up should be ongoing. The lines of communication should stay open. Now, do we have any questions before Shami comes in? Shami Carr will come in and talk about disability and small business hot topics. Any questions for me at this point? You can always ask them later or I'm gonna provide my email address, also my phone number, but please email me now, even if you just say, I wanna talk and I'll give you a call now or in the future. Thanks so much. Really appreciate your time. Shami? E Elaine, I did want to mention one thing before we start to talk about this slide. Okay. And when it comes to providing medical documentation, a good mm -hmm. practice is to make sure that you don't sign any releases. You want to protect your information. So when the employer asks for it, cooperate with them, provide it, but be in control of your medical documentation. Do not sign a blanket release. We find it is just much too dangerous. People are just much too nosy and living on an island. Everybody knows each other. <laughs> so it's best okay. to protect yourself. And that's just one advice I give to people with disabilities to make sure that they protect their information. That is great advice. That is absolutely great advice. And yes, limited information based on the need for the accommodation, not an open, not an open book, not an open, uh, um, not an open invitation to all of your medical information. Absolutely. Correct. Correct. I just wanted to jump on. I don't know if people can see me or not. Elaine, can you see me? I can see you just fine. Okay, great. I'm going to hide myself now. Okay. So when we started talking about this training with the EOC, we wanted to make sure that not only in light, of course, of, of all the resources that Elaine and her office can provide, um, we wanted to tag a little bit having to do with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Hopefully, most of you know that this is the 30th year anniversary, so it's a major milestone uh, for the Americans with Disabilities Act. And that's why we want to have just a few extra slides talking about um, disability in small business hot topics. So one of the things that we're seeing, obviously concurrently because of COVID-19 having to do with the direct threat um, issue. Now people will say, well, how does that affect disability? 
Um, is that a disability? Now, certainly the residual effects of COVID-19 can cause a disability. We know there's been some lung damage issue. There's been some respiratory in general, maybe even heart and kidney. So as this pandemic uh, continues, we certainly are seeing some medical um, implications and residual effects. But as a face value with direct threat, if the employer is only targeting people with disabilities to do COVID testing, then that is seen as discriminatory because they're treating people with disabilities in a different category. So if the employer then is uh, testing everybody, then that is not a direct threat issue specific to disability because that's, a, that's an issue with everyone in the workplace. And so that can't be bifurcated out to say this is just a direct threat for people with disabilities. So that's something currently that is ongoing. We unfortunately think it will continue to be ongoing because the pandemic is certainly not under control and we don't have a vaccine. And so this issue is going to continue to crop up. Now, I know that EEOC has information on COVID-19. There's some Q and A's. Uh, and again, that's something to keep apprised of because we don't want people with disabilities to, to be subject to extra um, issues that, that's not fair to them as seen as discriminatory. But we also wanna make sure certainly that the community at large is protected when it comes to COVID-19 and that people with disabilities as well as any other work, people in the workforce certainly can get testing and that's not seen as a, as a differential treatment. Another issue that we see for small business having to do with online uh, employee portals. And I bring this up even more so because we've seen in the field of disability that uh, a lot of employers have what they call intranets or employer portals. And they sometimes forget, or a lot of times they forget to make sure that these portals are accessible to people with disabilities. Because if you have to do your accrued time or your request time off on your portal and you can't access it, then that's a problem. If you need to do your payroll on the intranet, that's a problem. If there's trainings that are offered on the employee portal and you can't access it, that's a problem. If there are internal job opportunities and promotions that people can't access due to disability and access, that's a problem. So you can see on many different topics or interfaces that if an employee with a disability doesn't have full access to an employer por employee portal or an intranet, then you can see where the discrimination lies because they're not given that equal uh, employment opportunity, whether it may be, again, training, benefits, or otherwise. Now, there are some very good programs, software programs that can help employers to make sure that the internets and their employee portals are accessible. Most of the time, I would say 75 to 80 percent of the time this issue comes up has to do with people with visual disabilities. Um, that's the majority of the access that they're lacking. There are other ones who may have cognitive disabilities like learning disabilities or ADHD. There are software programs for them as well. And then in terms of if there's any kind of um, a sounds or volume issues, certainly that would affect people who are deaf or hard of hearing. But the majority that we're seeing are for folks who have visual types of disabilities. And if you have any questions, please feel free to follow up with me there's a lot of resources. There's a lot of software companies that can definitely address that so that if you are utilizing an intranet and much of the larger employers are, but there are some smaller employers who are doing their software management online and making sure that that is accessible uh, for employees with disabilities as well. Now, Elaine mentioned in a title for the ADA, the ADA Amendments Act of 2008. I wanted to bring that back up because the reality is that so many times that when someone thinks of someone with a disability, they think of someone maybe with an obvious disability. Someone uses a wheelchair, someone who has a service dog, someone who may use uh, an interpreter. Those are all obvious or disclosed disabilities. But what happened in 2008 is that the ADA Act was amended. And it was amended because what was happening is that so many of the Supreme Court rulings and other types of litigation was not holding up the real uh, defense of having to do with definition of disability. 
So what it was doing, it was actually taking away the congressional intent of the ADA to make sure that people with disabilities are defined and protected under the ADA. You had such uh, situations where people who had uh, maybe uncorrected 2020 vision, but didn't really fall under categorically under the ADA because of the significance of it. So what happened in 2008 is that there, the ADA was amended, the congressional intent was brought back. And one of the biggest um, uh, phrase or um, mantra that you heard had to do with what's called mitigating measures. Now, mitigating measures are measures that help mitigate or make your disability less or improve it. So for example, if I have diabetes and I take medication to mitigate my disability and I have no physical manifestations of that disability, I'm still a qualified person under the ADA, even though I may not have physical manifestations. Uh, a more blatant example could be Let's say that I use a wheelchair. Well, someone can say, well, that's your mitigating measure. It makes it better. You can still get around. But it doesn't fully address it because there's so many places that are inaccessible, including workplaces. So that's an example where you can still use a mitigating measure and it doesn't completely um, eliminate or lessen the disability fully. Okay? So that's very important because when we talk about documentation of disability, people have to keep in mind that disabilities that can't be seen and maybe disabilities that are episodic or, or, or semi-chronic, semi-not, or in the sense of obvious, again, being, being able to see the disability, this Amendments Act protects it even more so. So it's an important piece of legislation that adds on to the ADA. Now, we were just talking about disclosure. And again, I'm from upstate New York. I lived in a place that's like an island, like St. Thomas, where everybody knows each other. Everybody knows each other. So it's easy to say, well, she's not gonna tell you she had this problem. Oh, I saw her over here dealing with that. And so the reality is that, and Elaine talked about a little bit with the GINA Act, is that you may have information about this person with the disability, but that doesn't mean that you use that information, just like genetic information. This also happens, for example, when you do a fitness for duty or a medical examination post offer. So what will happen is an employer may do this medical examination and then a disability might get disclosed, but the person has never asked for an accommodation and the person has clearly never disclosed the disability. So what does the employer do? The employer does nothing with that information. They pretend like they never saw it. And so if they act on that, if they act on that inadvertent disclosure, so let's say that I have diabetes, but I also have a seizure disorder. Now I disclose my diabetes because I need to take medication at a certain time and I need to be able to keep, um, maybe you can't have uh, food or beverage at your desk, but I'm allowed to do the diabetes so that I can take my medication or be able to maintain my sugar levels but I also have a seizure disorder. So I go to the, um, some sort of medical examination, a seizure disorder is revealed. And so now all of a sudden the employer is acting different with me. The employer is acting a lot more cautious with me. And therefore that disclosure of that secondary disability, now I'm getting differential treatment because of it, even though I personally and fourth rate did not disclose that. That happens a lot with people with mental health disabilities. Uh, again, a medical examination, uh, they the, um, ask for any kind of medication that's taken. And then even though that medication does not disqualify them for that job duty, that now that employer knows that they're taking a medication related to a mental health. And you can be assured that a lot of people have been affected by this in terms of their treatment and in terms of their equal opportunity at the workplace. So disclosure is very sensitive and it's something where people really need to be in control of their information. So for a small business, a lot of times you may not have a full office. You may not have a full human resource department, but that person in the HR office should not have this sensitive information 
locked in the same filing cabinet as they do with HR or personnel files. They need to be kept separate. So that is an issue for small businesses because again of maybe space or because of their operations. So that's something to think about. And Elaine or I would be more than happy to help you figure out what's the best practice to make sure that you are not um, unduly or violating, for example, like HIPAA laws or ADA confidentiality. And again, making sure that as a small business, you do adhere to those rules as well. Um, so those were the main things I wanted to talk about when it comes to hot topics of a small business. I've been in the Virgin Islands on and off for 15 years with work. And I definitely know the issues that are here when it comes to disability. We know we have a cultural issue. A lot of people will not disclose, especially mental health because of the cultural implications. And this is certainly national, but it gets even more so uh, in the islands. And so there are some issues that are very culturally specific and wanna make sure that we as trainers are sensitive to that and making sure that people who have disabilities in the territory know that there are people who can help them kind of process that to make sure that they're asking for that reasonable accommodation in the most confident and also in the most sensitive way for them so that they feel like they can go ahead and ask that information, okay? So Elaine, if you wanna to go to the next slide. Okay, so one of the reasons I wanted to jump on it towards the end, not only to bring up specifically more ADA issues, but also to let the small businesses know there is a plethora of resources related to the ADA. You've got such organizations as Job Accommodation Network, which is out of the University of West Virginia. They are an amazing resource, and they are also funded with the U.S. Department of Labor Office of Disability Employment Policy, ODAP, and they also have resources. So JAN is, is federally, in for, or federally supported and they are a national program that also um, provides information and resources to the territory. One of their program has to do with the Employer Assistance and Resource Network on Disability Inclusion. The EARN program is a great resource and I'm sure, you know, uh, if I could, do, I, I should have done a poll to see uh, if people have ever even heard of Jan or the EARN program. But Elaine's gonna pull it up just so you get a sense of what it is. And it is something that absolutely, again, as I mentioned, ODEP under USDOL um, is an interactive platform that can help with recruiting, retention, advancements, and other resources in the state or territory. And they have, you can subscribe to their monthly newsletter you can also follow them on several social medias, including LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. And so Elaine, if you could just click on the actual hyperlink of EARN, just real quick. And so just so you can see what this uh, front page looks like. Which hyperlink are we looking at, um, yep. Xiaomi? Yep, you got it right, right there, yep. Okay, so you can clearly see that it is very focused on um, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, who they are. There's all sorts of information. They have a training center. They have a whole resource center. So again, I would encourage you to check them out and see if that's something that can help you as, as a new resource to you. Okay, great. Thanks, Elaine, for that very much. like it. Okay, so we'll go back to the PowerPoint and talk about some other resources. All right, so uh, one of the other things that's a major issue when it comes to ADA is reasonable accommodation. And this is a very wonky uh, link, unfortunately. We were trying to work through it and it doesn't come up on the PowerPoint, but if you Google it or put it, a cut and paste into um, a web page, it does come up. And the Society for Human Resource Management or SHORM for short is a great um, resource for many businesses, I know they've got a huge membership and their website has a ton of information. They did a really good job when it comes to, you know, the, the policies and the procedures around reasonable accommodation and I highly encourage you to check that link out. 
Now, the last, uh, next link has to do with Job Accommodation Network. I just spoke about them. And they have, uh, again, amazing website that has a lot of interactive opportunities. They've got a repository of, I would say, over 40 different types of disabilities. And you can see where it says A to Z of disability accommodations. I've been in the field for over 25 years. There are disabilities on, on there I haven't even heard of. So as an employer, I highly encourage you to not, do not fret if you do not know every disability. Again, I'm a disability expert. And I don't know every disability. I tell employers, if you have this resource at your fingertips, you can go ahead, go on there, learn more information about the disability and some accommodation ideas. And it's a great way to alleviate the anxiety of as an employer having to know everything about disability and it's just so uh, well laid out. It's very pragmatic. It's easy to read and it's in layman's terms. So it doesn't really talk about the law, but the function of the law. And so I can't encourage you enough as small business owners to uh, really get familiar with this website because you may come up with someone who has a disability like Addison. What is Addison? What does that mean? How does that affect someone? You know, you might know what bipolar autism is, but you may not know of a specific latex allergy, for example. You may not know of a certain type of chronic pain. And so this is a great repository. Again, I can't speak enough about Jane or Jan in terms of their resources for employers. And they do have a portal just for employers. You can see on top uh, with a the toolbar, they've got one for employers. Okay, great. Thank you, Elaine, for that, that's great. So now we'll go on to another slide. Again, just getting you familiar with different types of disability resources that are at your fingertips. And while we're waiting for um, the next slide, I do wanna put a little plug in that we're gonna have some more disability related trainings coming up. Um, one uh, next Wednesday, the 15th on accessible social media for employers. And then we'll also have one on policies of how to be able to create policies for disability in your workplace. Okay. Another great resource, and it's a partner of ours, is uh, Cornell Universities with the Employment and Disability Program. They have, there's a national project called the Disability Business Technical Assistance Centers, or DIPTEC. They were funded and they were created and funded after the ADA was passed in 1990. And these centers have been going at it for over uh, literally almost 30 years now, they started in 1992. And their hope was, Congress's hope was that after a couple of years, they wouldn't be needed anymore. Well, we see that's not the case. They're still around because the need is there. And one of uh, the resources that's housed with them is the, with the Institute on Employment Disability is their HR series. This is a, under another program with the EDI. And this is also for employers who want to learn more about, for example, disability non-discrimination regulations or management and HR process, um, employment process. And they also have a series like Jan, as I mentioned, with the uh, different types of disability. They also have a list as well. And what I tell employers is, is to you know, compare and contrast. Read Jan's, read uh, the, the uh, HR tips series You'll glean a lot of information. You'll see some of the same stuff, but you might get some additional information. So again, for a small business owner, you have so much resources available to you that you don't have to figure it out. Most of this has been written out for you. And then it's just a matter of you creating that baseline of information and then having that conversation with a person with a disability so that you can feel a little bit more confident and educated about the, the situation at hand. So again, Cornell, both with the Employment and Disability with hrtips.org and also the Northeast. If maybe uh, you could click on the Northeast one, Elaine, and we could just show them their website. Now, they just newly created um, a toolkit for small businesses. And that's something that we're also going to offer as a training to show you how to navigate that um, in its entirety in August. So that's another training we'll be doing in terms of making sure that small businesses know about this. It just, just came out in the last few weeks, so it's fresh hot off the press. And again, be looking for that in August. You can see there's an 800 number, and that 800 number is both for employees 
and people with disabilities, but it's also for employers. So please do not be shy to call them, ask them your question. They're not attorneys, so you don't have to worry about, you know, any kind of legal interpretation. They're also not an enforcement agency like the EEOC. So they're, they're kind of non-scary. You can call them and not feel any kind of way in terms of asking a question. You might feel like it's a stupid question or you might feel like I should know this, but I don't. It is okay. They are there for you to ask any question that you just feel like you need an answer for. And same thing with job accommodation. They have a toll-free number. You can call them as well uh, Again, small businesses and ask the questions and get the resources. One thing I didn't mention, but as I close, I just want to mention to you that there are tax incentives for small businesses in the territory related to disability. And this is something that we have a lot of information on. If you'd like to um, email me and uh, let me know in terms of how to get access to that, I'd be more than happy to share that with you. And on that note, let's close out my portion with, with uh, disability related information with the EEOC. As I mentioned, and Elaine also mentioned that there's a ton of resources on the EEOC's website, both for the ADA and small business in general. I just wanted to show a few that were related to the ADA. And um, here's the Small Business Resource Center. Again, it's not specific to disability, but it includes disability. You can see it's laid out really nicely. Everywhere, everything from tips to assistance to FAQs. And again, this is something that Elaine is connected with. And so again, you could just see great information um, the resource has everything as mentioned that also uh, Elaine talked about age discrimination, harassment, pay discrimination, retaliation, disability, religion, and so forth. So again, a very well laid out, very easy to navigate um, resource. And you can see on the toolbar that, oh, Elaine, if you wanna go back up to the toolbar, Great. So you can see under the EEOC, it says about EEOC, you see employees and job applicants. But the next one over, you can see there's employers and small businesses. And again, a ton of information. We could do a whole training just on the resources alone. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention because as Elaine mentioned, and that's how Elaine and I got talking is because so many businesses don't see EEOC as employer friendly or an employer resource. And we want to make sure that as a team with EEOC, SPDC, and DRCVI, that we are here also for the employers, and so is DRCVI. We also can talk to you about uh, disability resources and information and questions. So with that, I would like to hand it back over to you, Elaine, and thank you for this time to talk about disability specifically. Elaine, I'll hand it back over to you. So sorry, trying to unmute myself and not doing a very good job of that. No problem. Let me get let me get back to where we are were and also put myself on camera. Um, okay. Ah, doing that. Yes. All right. So I wanna um just wanna say that. There's lots and lots of good information as Shami discussed. And we have a last poll question of the day. Mary Jo, was there anything you learned today that surprised you about how the laws EEOC enforces are applied in the workplace? Anything that surprised you today? And more seconds. The poll is ending now. Yes, 100%. All right. Well, you know, I hope they were all good surprises. I hope that they were all valuable surprises and that you learned something that you didn't know today, before today. Um, I know that as, a, as an EEOC employee and just as an individual, I always feel that no matter how much I know, there's always more to learn. And regarding the laws and the application of the laws, things change often. 
So it's important to keep abreast of things using the resources that Shami discussed, using eeoc.gov as a resource. And also I'm available to answer your questions via email or, um, well, at this time via email is probably the best. So any questions, let's open it up to any questions that you might have. And do we want people to unmute themselves or do we want them to just type in the chat box? What is the preference here? They can unmute themselves. All right, we would love to hear your voices. You've been listening to us for an hour and a half. We would love to hear from you. Okay, well, maybe we have a silent group today, but that's okay because silent but steady, silent but sincere, those are all good traits. And, and I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. I know we all do. And want to tell you that we are here as your resource partners, all of us. Mary Jo from the VI Small Business Development Center, Shami Carr from the Disability Rights Center of the Virgin Islands, and myself. Don't know what if you want to, if you got your phone out, if you want to take a quick uh, snap of this slide and keep this so that um, it's like your personal business card with all of our contact information. Elaine? Yes, Shami. Yeah, um, certainly we can forward the PowerPoint to you if you'd like, just send um, that too. That too. Uh, Elaine an email and, and certainly get a copy of the PowerPoint as well. Yes. If you, I know if you lose my contact information, you can always find me on our external website. Everyone finds me there <laughs> and I get lots and lots of questions, but hey, it's job security. I'm here for you, okay? And I, I do try to respond promptly. I, I'm all about telling you if I don't know the answer, I will research the answer for you, or I will um, transfer you or give you the contact information whenever possible for another organization that can, can assist you. So we're all about here serving you. Thank you. And I will send out the presentation to all the attendees and the poll questions will be included. And if there are no further questions, nothing in the chat room? Nope, there's no questions in the chat box. Anyone, anybody want to unmute themselves and ask a question? Okay, well, with that, on behalf of the Virgin Islands Small Business Development Center that has offices on St. Thomas, St. John, and St. Croix, our counseling services are free of charge, so contact us. And on behalf of the Disability Rights Center of the Virgin Islands and the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, we wanna thank you all for attending today please feel free to contact any of us. And with that, we would like to bid you a fond good day. Thank you for attending. Bye-bye. Thank you all.